again, my name is John James. Uh, I'm the Director of Planning and Development Services for uh, the City of San Angelo. Um, our department includes uh, the Planning Division, which looks both at long-range planning for the city, developing a future vision for the city, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, also the Permits uh, and Inspections Division, which uh, does the building permits uh, and inspections process for, for new buildings and other things. Uh, and we also have the GIS division, which does our computer mapping, geographic information systems. And so uh, they're part of our department as well. We um, won't talk much about them today, but you may see some of the maps that they help uh, to create along with our other staff. Um, so just an overview of what we're going to be talking about. First, when we talk about what is city planning and why do we plan? So before we get into the nuts and bolts of permitting and uh, getting approvals for certain things, I wanted to kind of step back first and set the stage for wh why we do this and why is it important. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, over, you know, the overall uh, development process, all the steps in the development process, uh, the different kinds of things we do. Uh, again, what is the purpose for development regulations, why we do some of the things we do, and then some specifics on the development review process, including some helpful tips. One of the things I like is towards the end, I, we have some slides about uh, we went to every different division in the city, uh, both in my department and other departments, fire, marshal, engineering, et cetera, and asked them, what would you like to tell somebody who's a new applicant to the city? What, what are the common problems you see or things that they should know but don't when they come in? And so hopefully be, answer, be able to answer some of those uh, issues and, and point those out if you're about to start into certain, uh, certain processes with the city. Uh, and then, of course, there'll be plenty of time for questions. Uh, I know you, each of you may have a different perspective coming here, and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll give you this overview and answer some of your questions, but uh, be able to answer some specific questions to your situation if, if that's the case. So what is planning? Planning basically is trying to look out. A lot of the things we do is, is daily, weekly, monthly kinds of things, but planning is stepping back and looking out 10, 15, 20 years and answering the question, where do we want to be as a city out into the future? Because knowing what kind of city we want to be helps to answer some of those questions of how we regulate new development, uh, what kinds of things we, we need to require uh, of new development to help ensure that we get to that future vision that we want to achieve. Um, because there, you know, we all care about things like quality of life, and what kind of city we live in, um, but it's, it's some of these rules and regulations that we have in place that are the things that help us get to that future. Uh, otherwise, you know, cities, um, cities that don't have a lot of rules end up looking very different than cities who have very strict rules. And, and in comparison of cities around the country, we're on this sort of fewer rules end of the spectrum compared to some other cities. Uh, you, you know, you, even around the state, you look at some of the bigger cities, Austin or San Antonio, uh, developers that work in those places and come here think we're one of the easiest cities they've ever worked in. Uh, sometimes from the local folks, we hear a, a little bit different story, and, and that's not to say that either one is right or wrong, uh, but we think we're doing okay in terms of comparison with, with a lot of our peer cities. Uh, but we know there's room for improvement, and one of the things I'll talk about later is some of the things we've done to improve. Uh, but some of the things we're also working on. And one of the things we like to hear from the community is if, if you go through one of our processes uh, and have issues, we want to hear about them so that we can help fix them. Um, I think I've covered most of that. If you have questions about some of these, I'm not going to read each slide. But w why do we plan? Why do we create a plan for the future? One is to develop that community vision, but it's also to protect the public. A lot of what we do is protecting people. Uh, we want people to know if they walk into a new house, a new business, a new restaurant, that it's a safely constructed building that meets all of the building codes, health codes, and all of that sort of thing. So we're helping to protect the citizens of the community. Uh, preserving quality of life. We want to help make sure that as development happens, as the city grows and develops, we're building a community where people want to live and people want to come here. Because we know as people are, people are more mobile than they have been in decades past and people can up and leave and people do, the, the migration rates around the country and around the state are more than they've been in the past. And so we know we need to keep this as a community with a high quality of life if we want to continue to encourage businesses to come here, people to move here, 
uh, kids to come to school here and, and all of that. We need to make sure we're, we've got a good quality of life. Uh, it's also about protecting private property rights. A lot of a lot of people who interact with us think you know think of it only as we're telling them what they can do with their property, but there's a flip side to that. When when we tell you what you can and can't do at your home, we're helping to protect your neighbor who lives next door or the person who works behind another business. Uh, we're helping to um, basically mediate those issues that what you do on your property can affect your neighbor and a lot of our rules and regulations are helping to protect your rights by limiting what your neighbor can do on their property. Also encouraging growth and economic development. Um, uh, a lot of the things we put in place are to help ensure that we've got a community where we're drawing people in and it also facilitates decision making. As I mentioned, um, we make a lot of daily decisions as a city when I say we, we're the professionals who give advice and recommendations, but ultimately these big picture decisions are made by the city council. But I had one, one guy I used to work with used to say, cities grow one Burger King at a time. And you have to remember that each individual business that comes in, if a new Burger King's coming in, how the parking is laid out, if you require landscaping, do you put in sidewalks, how, you know, where can the be building be built? Where do you put the dumpsters? All of those little decisions that we make on each development make a difference in terms of how the community grows. And it's, sometimes it's hard to see how those things happen, but something as simple as not letting a business put the dumpster uh, right next to the back fence if there's a home on the other side of that fence. Little things like that are some of the things that we look at in terms of how we craft some of the rules that we have. Oh went too far. We do have a plan uh, that the City Council has adopted that basically says here's where we want to be in the future. Um, and the vision statement in that plan is that by 2027 we'll be the most desirable mid-sized city in Texas. Now that's kind of vague. Now the plan is more than just that statement, but that's what they started with. We want to be a high quality city that attracts people and attracts growth. And there's a lot of other goals within that plan that sort of point towards that overall vision. But that's kind of the starting point uh, of where we begin. Uh, so under that, they, they establish some mission statements that are, help us get towards that vision for the future. Uh, small town character, community spirit, uh, social, cultural, and recreational opportunities, quality of life, as I've touched on, uh, ensuring that downtown remains the heart of the city. Uh, various cities have different relationships with their downtown, but San Angelo has always said we want our downtown to be uh, a, a, a nice, high quality, attractive core where we encourage business. Uh, and while that doesn't mean we don't want business out of the edges of the community and continue to grow out, we want to make sure that we're not leaving a shell behind in the downtown, but we want that to continue to be uh, important as well. And then in, embrace principles that help ensure that future development is socially, environmentally, and fiscally responsible. I'll talk a little bit more about fiscally responsible in a minute, but that's another piece I haven't touched on is that uh, a lot of the development decisions we make as a city have impacts down the road in terms of costs. So one of the things that we're looking at right now is how wide do we build streets in new residential developments? Well, and you think, well, how, you know, how important really is that? Well. On the one hand, you have fire departments saying, well, we need wide streets so fire trucks can get to places quickly. On the other hand, the wider a street is, the more it costs us. As you know, we're, we're on an eight-year cycle of uh, reconstructing or, or resurfacing every street in the city. Well, the wider those streets are, the more that costs because we get charged by the contractors on a per square foot or per square yard basis. So like right now one of the things we're talking about is should a new residential street be 40 feet wide or 36 feet wide well we're looking at some other options too but that small change could make a big difference over the next 50 years in how much we spend to maintain our streets and so one of the things that we're looking at more than we have in the past is that issue of how do the decisions we make today impact the future costs to taxpayers in the city Again, I kind of covered the downtown. Uh, the, the city's plan does talk about ensuring that the downtown is uh, and remains the core. But one of the things we've been working on recently is encouraging residential development. And we've started to see more 
residential interest in people living downtown. And that's a trend basically statewide and nationwide is uh, there, there's a market for people who want that sort of urban style living that most cities don't have enough of to meet that demand. And that's what we've heard from developers who are looking at putting housing in downtown is uh, one example that is going through the process right now. Uh, they're almost fully leased out for something that they haven't even started building yet. And so we know there's a market there and we want to help encourage that. While at the same time, I don't want to skip over this last one, ensuring that we maintain that character, particularly of hist historic buildings downtown. Uh, we want to make sure that we, we keep that feel that actually draws people to the downtown. Uh, neighborhood centers, making sure that our commercial areas uh, accommodate the types of development trends that we're seeing, uh, making sure they're pedestrian friendly. One of the things, uh, again, I think I have some slides on this later, but um, we're seeing more and more interest in walkability um, and being able to get around town by means other than, than cars. And again, that doesn't apply to everybody necessarily, but uh, we do have a university population. We have kids that walk to school every day. Making sure that they can do that safely is important. Uh, open space, everybody loves parks. We have a good system of parks and trails here. We wanna make sure that we keep that up, but expand that where we can uh, to make an even better system. And so how do we implement this plan? Once we've established that future vision for the city, here's what we wanna look like. There's really two ways from the city's perspective that we do that. One is through city action, actually doing things, going out and building roads, building projects, um, economic development, bringing things in, spending money to do things. The other is through development regulation, is putting rules in place that ensure businesses are built a certain way, homes are built to certain standards. And so all of those things add up to uh, getting us to that future vision that we want to see. And so then we, a number of different groups are involved in planning. Citizens obviously are at the start. Uh, all of our projects we solicit community feedback and input because again our job as professionals is to help guide the discussion but our role is not to make these decisions. That's for the community to make and so we try to get as much feedback from citizens as we can. Um, and then we work with the city's planning commission and city council who are the ones that ultimately make the recommendations and decisions on any of these kinds of things, whether it's the plan or the development rules that are adopted. So this is sort of a brief overview of the whole development process. It starts with annexation. If property is not already within the city limits, the first step is to bring it into the city and that's done through annexation. Uh, the city does have the ability to do that. Uh, either with the property's request or without the property's uh, permission, cities do have the authority under state law to grow and expand to accommodate future growth. And a part of that uh, is what's called the extraterritorial jurisdiction. The city has some ability to create rules outside the city limits. In our case, it's three and a half miles outside the city limits. We can place some rules on development under the idea that that's the area we will grow into someday. So we want to ensure that the streets and the utilities and all of that, when it does come into the city, meet, meet certain minimum standards. And one of the things that um, go, kind of goes along with that, this is a, a history of annexations in the city. And sometimes you hear people say, well, the city shouldn't be able to regulate things outside the city limits. But if we the way I like to look at it is if, if we froze our city boundaries, say in 1950, we wouldn't have been able to grow and accommodate all the new homes and commercial developments that we've had because we wouldn't be able to grow. And so just like if you looked at it from the perspective of 1950, if you look at it from the perspective of today, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, our city is going to be bigger than it is today, hopefully, if we continue to grow and develop. And so we need that space to continue to grow. Can you ask? Yeah, go ahead. Is extraterritorial extra jurisdiction, is that for planning or is that for permitting? Well, it's, it's for planning and it's for property subdivision, which I'll get to in a second, but it includes utilities and roads, but it does not include zoning and it does not include building permits. So building permits aren't required and there are no land use restrictions in the ETJ. Yeah, on, on your ETJ, one thing I've always wondered about, once you annex the ETJ into the city, the people living within those limits, are they able to vote 
Yes, yes absolutely. Once you come into the city limits, you're a, you're a citizen of the city and you can vote in any of the city related. In ETJ. Not in the ETJ. No, you have to be in the city limits. So I know that's sometimes an issue if you're in the city, if you're in the city's ETJ, you're, you're under some of the rules of the city, but you can't vote for city council and that sort of thing. Uh, but that is, that's the system that was set up under state law. Uh, all cities were designated an ETJ where certain rules can, can be in place, um, but without the ability to vote. But they are being, I mean, they are being taxed. If no, I'm... no, no. If you're in the ETJ, you don't pay taxes either. You don't get to vote for city council, but you also don't have to pay the taxes. All you have to do is, if you're developing property in that area, you have to come to the city and get approval for certain things. Will the city utilities go into that area? No. To get city utilities, there are a few exceptions, but for the most part, to get city utilities, you have to ask to be annexed into the city before we'll extend our city services. So ET is for uh, future development planning? Yes, it's kind of, it, one way to look at it is a holding zone where that's the area we plan to grow into, and so we can ensure that roads are built to our standards and uh, utilities are, we accommodate future expansion of utilities into that area. So the, in the ETJ, it's more or less on holding pattern without utilities and without being in the city limits. Once, once you uh, annex it, well then you run utilities out to in, into the area. Then. Correct. Okay. That's right. It's, so the ETJ, would it be considered incorporated or unincorporated? It would be unincorporated. So then once, once property's in the city, we have zoning, which is basically the land use restrictions, what you can and can't do in each zone. And initially, historically, um, it was a way to separate like industrial uses from homes. You, you didn't want a factory to go in right next to homes. So uh, early on in the 1900, early 1900s, cities created these zones where, okay, this was an area for residential, here's commercial, here's industrial. And over time, we've gotten a little more uh, specific with it. So in some areas, we only allow single family homes. Other areas can allow apartments. Uh, we have heavy commercial where you can do auto repair, but we also have neighborhood commercial where you can't do those heavier kinds of things, typically closer to, to homes. Uh, but basically, the zoning is a way to establish what uses can be done in what parts of town. Uh, each of the zoning districts regulates not only land use, but a number of other things like building heights. So in a residential area, for example, uh, we typically limit to about 35 feet, I think. So a two, maybe, maybe a three-story house is as tall as you could get. Whereas in downtown or other commercial areas, you could build you know, a 10-story office building if you wanted to. We also have things like lot coverage, um, parking standards. So for each new commercial business, for example, we require them to have a minimum amount of parking um, to ensure that there is adequate parking for, for all the businesses. But also, more importantly, is to not create negative impacts in the surrounding areas by creating spillover parking. Um, and I mentioned general categories are commercial, industrial, and residential, but each of those are broken down into more specific uh, ca categories. <clears throat> The purpose is to protect the health, safety, and welfare, and so um, all of the rules that fall under zoning relate back to some element of health, safety, and welfare. Uh, as you asked earlier, zoning does only apply within the city limits, not outside the city uh, in the ETJ. Uh, the city council does make all final decisions on zoning, so planning staff reviews it, works with applicants. We make recommendations oftentimes, and it goes to the planning commission, who also makes a recommendation but ultimately it's city council that makes the final decision. Uh, we do uh, help ensure that the zoning decisions that are made are in keeping with uh, the comprehensive plan that we've adopted. So we often look back to what kinds of goals and the maps in those comprehensive plans to say, well, is this an area that's appropriate for commercial? If we often have people ask about, it's zoned residential today, but it's vacant. Can I convert it to a commercial use? Well we look at those on a case-by-case -case basis and sometimes we say yeah that makes sense in that area other times we say you know what it's completely surrounded by homes it doesn't make sense for that to become commercial zoning is discretionary so city council can just say you know it makes sense for that area or it doesn't and they pretty they pretty much have a wide latitude in terms of making those decisions um, zoning is is basically 
two elements to the zoning ordinance. One, one is the ordinance itself, and that sets out all of these rules for things like parking and setbacks and heights and all of that. And then there's the map, and that's the, what actually breaks down the city into these zones. So any, any lot in the city has a zoning on it. So my house, for example, is zoned for single family homes. Down the street, there's commercial zoning where there's a business. And so uh, each property has a zoning that establishes these, these rules within that area, what they can and can't do on the property. Now, another part of the, uh, the development process is subdivision. That's actually splitting up land. So if you have a bigger tract of land and you want to split it in two to sell off a piece of it, then you have to go through the subdivision process. And that can be as simple as, like I said, splitting one lot into two pieces, or it can be taking a huge lot and splitting it up into, you know, 30 homes with streets and, and all of that 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 entails. So subdivisions can be simple up to very complex multi-home subdivisions. Um, platting is required for almost any time you're splitting up a piece of property to sell it, platting is required. One of the issues we see a lot is people going out and buying a part of a larger property from someone without it being platted and then they have problems down the road because you can't get building permits if it's not platted. Uh, we've seen cases, um, we've seen, ca I've seen cases where um, you took a big lot, say it's this whiteboard, you sell off this piece, you sell off this piece, and ultimately you sell off the surrounding and they left a hole in the middle. And somebody, for some reason, buys that hole and they don't even have access to a street. Well, if they had gone through the platting process, that's one of the things we help ensure is that all the properties being created have adequate access to roads and sewer and water and all of that. So uh, that's a step that sometimes gets skipped and unfortunately people realize that it's a problem after they've bought a piece of property. Uh, and so if, if, if you're looking at buying a piece of property, one of the things you should always check is, is it platted? Is, is it subdivided legally? Su subdivision approval, let me finish this last one real quick and then I'll get to your question. Subdivision approval in contrast with zoning is not discretionary. The subdivision ordinance has a list of rules. If you meet those rules, you get subdivided. The city can't say, eh, we just don't really like that. You, you, you can't do it. It's, it's you meet those rules and you get it. Yeah. I, I was looking at a building downtown and I was told that the owners would sell me the upper stores and they were gonna keep the lower stores. Now, how are they subdividing that building? Well, that's an interesting example because when we talk about subdivision, we're only talking about the land. And so if you're splitting a piece of land, then you have to go through this process. You can have one piece of land and you can own the first floor and somebody else can own the second floor. Uh, you know, in, in a condo situation, you know, we have apartments where uh, in an apartment building, each individual apartment unit can be sold instead of rented. So I may own that apartment so in one building, there may be 20 different owners. We don't see as much of that as say in the bigger cities, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, uh, but we are seeing some interest in, in that, but you would not have to go through this process if you were gonna split a building in two like that. It has to go through a condominium. Uh, it has to be subdivided as a condominium project. Uh, you'd wanna check with an attorney on that. Um, one way to do that is to condominiumize it, but I'm not real familiar with the legal rules for how that happens. But yeah, it, in terms of what we're talking about here, you wouldn't have to go through this process to split a building like that, as long as you weren't splitting up the land. Uh, some of the typical subdivision standards are the layout, as I mentioned, lots and blocks. We wanna make sure that all, um, properties have access to a street and water and sewer, uh, adequate facilities, road layout and design. You'll notice in the city of San Angelo, at least a little more than other cities I'm familiar with, we have situations where two roads come together at a major road and they don't line up. Well, that's one of the things we look for. Roads should line up. We've got an example actually, if I'm not turned around, right out here at College and Chadburn. If you're coming from City Hall, college hits Chadburn and then it's a little bit of an angle to get over to to go down college like towards Shannon and so um, I would say that was probably poor decision making at some point in the past but one of the things we look for is to make sure that roads connect through and there's a good system of roads and another problem we've seen in the past is 
If you have neighborhoods that are built with too many cul-de-sacs and not enough through streets, then that creates other problems from congestion, uh, inadequate response times for police and fire. Um, and so that's another thing we look at is to ensure some good connectivity of streets so that as each incremental development happens, we're keeping a, that big picture look in our head too to make sure that everything's lining up right. Uh, we also ensure that there's, if you're not making improvements today, we, we require financial security. So developers sometimes will split up the land and then basically promise to build the roads in the future. Well, they have to put up some sort of financial guarantee. So if the developer goes out of business, um, we have the money in place, we could go out and finish those streets. Um, and that, that's kind of a win-win because the developer doesn't necessarily have to front the cost of building all of the streets throughout a whole new neighborhood. They can do it incrementally, but we're protected as citizens and taxpayers that we're not gonna be left on the hook for the cost of those improvements. Um, I'm not sure I touch on this here, so while I'm thinking about it, I'll mention that a lot of those improvements as development happens are made by the developer. So we as taxpayers don't have to pay for the new streets. The developer building the new neighborhood or putting in a new commercial development, they're responsible for extending water and sewer lines and building the streets out to that area. Now, it doesn't come cost free to taxpayers because there is a back end cost of maintenance long term. So the developer builds those facilities but then gives it to the city then we as taxpayers are on the hook for those long-term costs. But it, again, it's kind of a win-win uh, in, in terms of how that process works. Uh, it does, I mentioned earlier, it does protect future purchasers of land by ensuring that lots that you buy that are platted do meet those minimum standards. Uh, site plan is when we go into non-residential development. So if you're coming in with a commercial development, you have to bring in a plan of the site and that's where we check everything from parking and landscaping and sidewalks and fire lanes and, and all of those sorts of things to make sure that they do meet all the rules. Uh, that's basically how we check to make sure those sites are laid out in accordance with uh, our standards. Um, so permits, once you, you're in the city, you're zoned, you've got subdivided, and you're ready to actually build something, that's where the permits and inspections process comes in. Uh, and they maintain and update the, our construction codes. Uh, we just recently adopted an, the, the almost newest set. We just adopted the 2015 building codes. Uh, actually, the 2018 codes are out now, but it'll probably be another couple of years before we, we get to those. But uh, these standard building codes that are used by almost every city you know, in the whole country, that's what we adopt as our standards. So we don't make up our own building codes for how buildings have to be built safely. We use these standard codes. Now we do create local amendments. So for example, we'll, we'll say, well, the national code says you have to do plumbing this certain way. Locally, our plumbers have gotten together and said, you know, we could do it this way and it works just as good. And so we do sometimes have those kinds of local amendments to those codes. But most, 99% of our codes are just the standard codes that are used nationwide. You mentioned National Building Code, is that correct? It's actually called the International Building Code. Um, it's, it's largely a U.S.-based set of codes, but they call it an international code because they're encouraging other countries to use the same code. Um, but sometimes when you call it an international code, that you know raises red flags to some people. But it is, it's called the International Building Codes by the International Code Council is where it comes from. John, I have a question back on zoning. Yeah. How, how did the term non-conforming ever come about? Well, so if you establish zoning on a piece of property and let's say, let's say you zone a property residential, mm -hmm. but it's got a commercial use on it. Well, the zoning says you can't have a commercial use, but back when they created zoning, they realized, well, if, if there's already a commercial use there, you're not going to go in and tell them, hey, you have to move. Right. So what you say is, well, if you were already there before zoning was in place, you get to continue. So you're, you're non-conforming, so you don't conform to the existing rules, but you get to continue as is for as long as you want. But the flip side of that is you get to continue as is. You can't expand, you can't, you can't do other 
uh, things that are out of conformance with the rules, you can just keep the operation you've got as it is today. Otherwise, you would need to rezone to commercial or, or whatever the appropriate well, why use would is. Why would not be able to keep in the non-conforming rules? In almost every case, you can. It's only when you want to expand the building or do something new in the building. Uh, I mean, let's say you were a shoe what store and now you want to be a restaurant. I don't know, Hillary, help me here. Is, is there a case where you would, if you're not creating a new use, you're not expanding the building, um, I can't think of an example where you wouldn't be allowed to continue as a non-conforming use. I mean, that, our ordinance has a whole section on non-conforming uses, which basically says... There's a process to go around. To, to, to well, we have a process, one process that's called expansion of a non-conforming use. So without rezoning your property, right. you can actually take a case to expand the use. So non-conforming use came about prior to there being zoning laws? Well, no, when the first zoning laws were adopted, they recognized that sometimes properties are going to be zoned differently than they're currently being used. So the idea is, for that example of it's a commercial in a residential area, over time the hope is that it will become residential. So if that business closes, and they go out of business for five years, a new business can't come in. If something else goes in there, it has to be residential. So the idea is you, you get towards where you want to be, but you're not going to penalize somebody who was already in place before the zoning. So the early zoning ordinance is recognized that you don't want to drive somebody out of business. They get to continue as is. But you also, if you've said that's a residential area, we don't want more commercial, you don't want them to keep growing and expanding. Ideally, they would find a what would be considered under the zoning a more appropriate location that's zoned for commercial. That might be 50 years from now, but that's the idea okay. long term. Yeah. And, and what you're related to out there with the commercial within the residential, would that be what you call spot zoning? Well, spot zoning is tricky. Spot zoning, there's, it depends on, it depends on if you're asking a lawyer or not. There's, there's what I would call illegal spot zoning, which is zoning one property different than everything around it without a good reason. Now, there can be a good reason if, you know, if you've got a whole residential area and you want a corner store at a major intersection in that neighborhood, it might make sense for just one spot of commercial zoning in an area that's all the rest of its zoned residential. So... It can be spot zoning, but it's it's only what the courts call illegal spot zoning <laughs> if you can't back it up with a good justification. So the idea is you can't tell my neighbor he can do something on his property and then tell me I can't unless there's some reason we're so different that that makes sense. I know it's kind of kind of a vague explanation. But. I know that the state states that you, you zone the entire block. Now, is that taken, like if you have a um, facing this street, and then you got an alley with property facing this other street. Now that block, is that the entire city block with the two streets? No, a whole city block doesn't have to be zoned the same. In fact, that sort of example you have, we have all over the place where uh, on Sherwood, for example, the properties facing Sherwood are zoned commercial, but then maybe there's an alley and there's residential homes behind them that are, that are zoned residential. So that's not uncommon to be in fact, we have some properties that half the property is zoned one thing, half of it's zoned another. That creates its own problems, but on large properties, that's not uncommon. Yeah. I have a question as far as uh, properties on the lake and how currently people can purchase that land that's on the lake. <coughs> um, is it true that that could be possibly rescinded at some point in time? The Maybe purchase? By the city? No, by the city saying for any future for any future land deal or purchases of the property that's no longer available? Because that was something that's come up about two or three years ago that they were talking about people that were out at the, the, the homeowners association out at the lake got together and they were worried that it might be rescinded or changed so that property owners would not have the option to purchase the land. Well. I'll give you the short answer last. I'll give you the longer answer is um, the current city policy is their goal is to sell those properties. Um, and so I've not heard anything that would suggest that that might change. 
the short answer is yes, they can. The, the city is the owner of those properties. So if, if this city council or some future city council decided, hey, wait a minute, we want to keep those lots, they could always make that decision. So um, it, it's really at the discretion. The, the city council is the decision maker for the city as an entity, uh, kind of like the board of directors for a company. And as the owner of those properties, they could decide to sell them or not sell them. Now there are some state laws that come into effect. So for example, if, if I lease a home at the lake on a leased property, um, or if I lease the property and, and own the home, the city's obligated to offer, if they want to sell it, I get first choice to buy it. The city, if I'm, if I'm leasing it and living there, the city can't say, well, I'm going to go sell it to this other person. So I get first dibs if I live there. So there are some rules in place, but the city could always decide not to, not to sell those properties. But I, I have heard in no discussions about that being, I, right now the city really wants to sell as many of those as they can. And my follow-up question is as far as on the Arroyo, how the YMCA is now going, I guess they got about a two or three or four year plan to, they've already made the purchase of that property where the church used to be, where it, I guess it used to be Second Baptist Church and then Glen Meadows bought it. And now the, the whole deal where now the YMCA has got a plan to put something in there as far as a facility. I actually um, haven't heard anything about the YMCA having plans, but it, sometimes we're the last to know when they actually well, they've got signs, they got signs out there and I ran into a lady that works for the YMCA and she said it's like a two or three year plan for them to expand there. Um, you're talking about Glen Meadows out of the no, lake? No, 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 or, not Glen Meadows. Or, the, 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 right there on the Arroyo on College Hills right there across from the driving range or the little putt-putt place mm -hmm. um, adjacent to that right there across from the dog park and mm -hmm. things like that that property that's been for sale through a local realtor um, it, it has a sign up there for the YMCA mm -hmm. uh, maybe children's facility or children's development. I think if it's the building I'm thinking of there's a daycare center and I don't know if you know anything about that yeah it's like a white building um, yeah my recollection is that that was going to be some type of daycare facility but I didn't know it was related to the YMCA at all but um, I'm not real familiar with with that yeah again we like I said sometimes we've heard about new developments coming into the city from reading it in the newspaper you know before they even come to our office so um, Sometimes we're in the know early on when people come to us, but sometimes, you know, we're the last to know. Well, my question is, would that be something, since it is um, a civic organization and nonprofit, would they make a deal, the city could possibly make a deal where they got to purchase that land? Like, for example, across the street where you've got the driving range slash putt-putt, mm -hmm. that place of property has been for sale, but that's also a city-owned, like we were talking about earlier, city-owned property where the landowner, or I mean the, 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 the owner of the, the business has no option to purchase the land because it's city owned. Well, and again, that comes down to anytime the city gets a request for someone to purchase a piece of property that's city owned, it goes through a process of review and departments say, you know, does anybody use this or need it? And if not, then it can go up for sale. But then there's a process uh, we can't just sell it if it's not a leased lake lot property and that's got different rules that apply that you have to offer it to that person. Um, most properties then have to go through a basically a bid process where uh, it gets listed for sale and anybody can bid on it and the highest bidder gets it is kind of the way it works. Um, so permits again the purpose here for permits is ensuring that all buildings are constructed to a certain minimum standard, that they're built safely, uh, and that's everything from the building itself to the plumbing, electrical, all the mechanical work, uh, and all of that. We also verify that contractors uh, are registered and properly licensed. So one of the things I encourage people to ask is if you're hiring a plumber or electrician or a, a builder, uh, make sure they're registered with the city because we ensure that they have all the proper licenses required by the state and all of those things. And uh, one of the, this last bullet, we investigate complaints about substandard construction. Nine times out of ten, when we get complaints about, hey, my plumber didn't do a good job, or they built this carport and it's fallen over, 
nine times out of 10, it was an unlicensed contractor that was doing the work. Um, and I'll be honest, some of our, our best contractors are the strongest proponents of some of these rules because it keeps the, the fly-by-night guys um, from doing their thing. I mean, the guys who know what they're doing and do it right appreciate having rules in place that keep the guys who don't know what they're doing, it helps discourage them from working in the, in the city and, and doing things that ultimately aren't safe for our citizens. And here's all the different types of permits. This may not even be all the types of permits. These are our most common types of permits, but everything from building permits to plumbing, we permit pools to ensure that they meet uh, certain pool standards. Even to demolish a building, uh, we incur where we require you, know, you to get a permit for that. Fence permits on there, just to point out if it's under, we just changed the rules eight feet now. If it's under eight feet, you don't have to get a permit, but if it is eight feet or taller, you do have to get a fence permit and we require some engineering be done uh, to ensure that it's it's safely constructed. I think it was just in the last last month maybe. Um, I'm guessing there was an issue with a with a I just got a permit. A, well, but that's what that's what I was saying earlier before the class started. I, I really wish this the about a month ago. Per, permit department, the, the, the infrastructure we all could be here at the same time because what you're, what you're saying is really, really great and it, and it sounds really good. But in, in real time, that don't exist. And, and, and really, I mean, just like he was saying about the fence, I mean, it, 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 you're delivering that like if it's something that's really great, and it is really great, but it's not get, getting passed down the line. You know, I have, uh, trust me, I, I want permits to be put in place because it protects our, I mean, many years, I'm a, I'm a master plumber. I've been a master plumber for 27 years. And yeah, I, I want to make sure that no fly-by-night guy sure. and people or a handyman comes in there and does it. But there's there's so much, there's there's so many steps that are being being missed right here because the, the governing authority that we have to deal with, including infrastructure, uh, you, you know, we, 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 we all got licenses to do what we have, and when we have to pull a permit from somebody that doesn't even have a license or has a, a, a stamp, an engineer stamp, it makes it incredibly hard because they're going on by what they think, they assume, or somebody that doesn't have that stamp tells them to do. So that's what I'm saying. I would come to every single class, providing that every department that, that covers that discipline would be here because what you're saying is not happening. That is not happening. Well, and, that's, and I'll get to a little bit of some of the improvements we're, we're making here in a little bit, but um, I'll, I'll mention two things, if I can remember both of them. Uh, the first one is we do have processes in place if if you think you're being told and and this happens frequently um if if you hear something from an inspector in the field hey this plumbing's not done quite right you need to do it this way you can go talk to the building official and say hey this is plumbing inspectors telling me this i don't think that's what the code says and then we have a process where the building official can look at it uh and if it's they actually it, your inspector in the department is super strong well, but, but, but then we also have, we actually have a what's called the Construction Board of Appeals that's made up of citizens, plumbers, electricians, all different types of tradespeople. And if you don't like the decision or the, the, what we're telling you, you can even appeal to that board and they can say, they make a final interpretation of what the building codes or plumbing code, whichever applies, says. Um, and so we... Sure, that's not what the, the okay. problem we're having. The problem we're having is just... What I mentioned earlier is, is trying to get the proper dialogue down the line the way it needs to be. I, I guarantee you that the, you got a strong inspection department. Plumbers, electricians, structural, we all stump our toe. We all get red tagged. But you have a pretty strong department. It, it's your infrastructure back that needs help. And, and I think if they were to get come in here on these little classes with the people that have to deal with them, with somebody like you involved, I think it would be smoother because who would want to build when it's having to, you know, uh, it, 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 many a contract has been lost over an eight-foot fence permit. That, that now you're saying it's okay. Yeah. 
you, you know, the, 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 we're, we're missing something. Well, and, and hopefully I'll answer part of that question uh, here in a little bit with some of the processes we have where we encourage people to come in early and our goal is to get them, here's all the list of things you need to know because the last thing we want to do is in your example of, okay, here's all the things you need to do, you do them and then bring it back and then we say, oh yeah, there's a couple things we forgot to tell you. Um, and so that's something we're very actively trying to avoid uh, as much as possible. Um, I'm not going to go through all these different types of permits, but uh, just to point out a couple of things, uh, building permits typically pulled by a general contractor, but an owner can pull building permits if they choose to. Uh, on the other hand, some of the electrical and plumbing types of permits, uh, electrician, for example, is required for most electrical work. There's some stuff you can do yourself as a homeowner, but uh, a lot of things do require an electrician or a plumber that's licensed with the state. Uh, and a lot of folks, homeowners trying to do their own work, don't always know that. And so that's something we try to make sure people understand is that, yes, there are some things you can do yourself. If you are doing them yourself, you still have to get a permit. Um, but there are some things you absolutely can't do yourself. You have to hire a professional to do that for you. And then we, we go through plan review. So the first step in a commercial development, for example, is is looking at the plans. Before anything happens on the ground, we get plans of what the building's gonna look like, how the plumbing's laid out, where the electrical's going, and that way we find a lot of issues before anything actually gets going uh, on the ground. Then once things get going, we do foundation inspections, we do initial inspections. Again, I'm not gonna go through each of these, but every step in the process, inspectors are going out. Uh, like here, he's looking at the, the stuff behind the walls before the walls go up. So our inspectors go out on jobs multiple times um, to make sure that things are being done uh, throughout the process. And then finally, the last step is a certificate of occupancy. That's basically saying you've met everything and you're good to go. We're done. Open your business or m move into your home, uh, that sort of thing. Um, change of occupancy is slightly different. That's where you're not building something new but you're changing what's happening in the building. So I'm gonna flip that example on the bottom. Let's say you've got an office building and you wanna convert it into a restaurant. Well, you have to go through this change of occupancy uh, for a number of reasons. One is the things that are regulated for a restaurant are very different than an office. And so you have all kinds of health rules that we need to look at. So if you're going from one office to another, the things you have to do in our department is very, very limited. In many cases, you don't even have to come to us for any permits or anything, depending on what kinds of things you're doing. But if you're converting from an office to a restaurant, then you do have to come back through our processes for a change of occupancy to make sure that you're meeting those additional things that maybe an office wasn't required to do, but a restaurant is required. Uh, that's, the, that's the overview of everything. So now I wanna get into some of the specifics. Um, before I do that, I, there's a, I, in these presentations, I like to talk about a couple of different hot topics, things that we're looking at, and one of them I mentioned briefly earlier is walkable communities. Um, San Angelo is the only city in the state with over 75,000 people that doesn't require sidewalks in new development. That's 50-something cities around the state, everything from Dallas and Houston down to Abilene, Midland, Odessa, Amarillo, Lubbock, uh, you know, all of the cities we compare ourselves with up to the biggest cities in the state, we're the only ones that don't require sidewalks in new development. So right now we're, we're working on a sidewalk ordinance uh, and, and some developments we do, I mean there's very limited, but almost every one of these other cities requires it for almost all new development. Um, new homes, for example, we don't require sidewalks for new neighborhoods. If you're building 20 new homes, creating a new neighborhood, you don't have to put in sidewalks. Almost every other city in the state, our size and bigger, in fact, all of them require sidewalks in new residential development. Um, so that's something we're looking at. Even the National Association of Realtors did a survey and, and they find that there is a shortage of neighborhoods that are walkable and that's something that's becoming more and more desirable, especially of younger uh, homeowners. Um, and I just threw in this statistic that, uh, and one of the other things we're talking about, the city council has asked us to look at a new bicycle plan. Well, uh, 
once every eight days a pedestrian or bicyclist is hit by a car. We think one of the reasons that's the case is we don't have bike lanes on many streets. We don't have sidewalks on most streets. But we know there are people out there walking and, and bicycling. And if you, you, look, you drive down the roads and if you look, a lot of our roads have those little worn paths uh, beside the road. Uh, one example that we're, we're looking at right now, in fact, related to the university, if you look from the university down to HEB on Avenue N, there is a well-worn path up and down that from students walking from the campus down to HEB and back. From HEB about a few couple hundred feet, there's a sidewalk, but then it ends. And so that's an example of where clearly the desire is there for people to be walking, but they don't have a safe place to do it. Um, and especially if you're not able-bodied, if you're in a wheelchair, if you're a mom with a stroller, there's really no way to get up and down that. And so we're looking at helping to address that in future development. Yeah. You mentioned that that's a, that's a terrible rate with the bicyclists, and I've had an acquaint, a, acquaintance that was hit and killed uh, by a bicyclist, and I've witnessed, I saw a bicyclist being hit on Knickerbocker. And so. Yeah, and, and that's another example of where if we look around at other cities, um, again, not just looking at Austin or Houston or Dallas, but looking at cities like Midland and Lubbock and Abilene um, are farther ahead than we are uh, in terms of sidewalks and bike lanes and bike paths and those sorts of things. And so um, it's something the city hasn't looked at a whole lot, uh, but we're moving in that direction and we're hoping to address some of these concerns. Uh, and just quickly, uh, s some of the national surveys that are done is even in cities that have better sidewalks than we do, people are wanting more sidewalks and better walkability in their communities. And I don't want to miss that last piece is that having a safe place to walk is the number one reason that surveys show people don't walk more. Um, I don't think I have this on a slide, but in 1965 or so, uh, about 80 60 to 80 percent of kids walked or biked to school. Today that number is about 15 percent nationwide. In San Angelo that number is more like 10 percent. Um, part of the reason for that, I know there are other reasons, perception of safety and some of those sorts of things, but we know a lot of people in town would let their kids walk to school uh, if only there was a safe place to do it. Uh, and so one of the things that there's a, a federal program called Safe Routes to Schools um, and the city has actually gotten grants in the past and we hope to get more grants in the future to help build sidewalks that will connect neighborhoods to schools. Uh, but again, we can't, it's gonna be slow going to fix what we've done or in the past, but if we just start building new sidewalks in new development today, we won't exacerbate that problem into the future. And so that, again, that's something we'll be looking at. Um, I'm going to kind of skip this, but the, the main point of this slide is that when, when people are asked, you know, would you bike more if it was safer to do so, about a third of people say, no, I don't bike, I'm never going to bike. Maybe elderly people, maybe people just that don't have any interest, but about 60% of people are what this study called interested but concerned. Yeah, I'd like to bike a little more, either for recreation or even bike to work, but there's really not a safe place to do it. Then at the top, you've got those folks that I call the, the you know, the guys on the $2,000 bike and spandex. They're going to bike anywhere. They're the people who bike on Knickerbocker and don't care. Um, and, and that's fine. We, we have roads that are good enough for them, but we don't have roads good enough for the, you know, the eight-year-old that wants to ride her bike to school. And that's kind of what we want to focus on. Uh, I'm going to skip this. This is in your slide, but this is some of the statistics. Uh, I'll just point out one that, that surprised me. Uh, Seven percent of households in the city don't have a car. That's one out of 14 homes in the city. The people who live there don't own a car. And I know, looking at most of us, I, I'm guessing we all have cars. We use cars for most of our activities. But we have to remember that there are people in this city that the only way they get places is walking, bicycling, or taking the bus. And so we want to make sure as planners looking for the whole community, that we're not forgetting that there are those people out there and that's why we look at things like bike lanes and sidewalks is to, ad is to address their, their needs as well. And I, I sort of previewed this a little earlier but just briefly on fiscal impacts. 
uh, and this is just one example, but the road cost for different densities of housing. So if you build a whole neighborhood of 6,000 square foot lots, which is a typical, you know, moderately sized uh, neighborhood lot, the cost of road improvements averaged out over the years is about $36 per home. That's long-term maintenance. That's not the initial construction. But if you double that to 12,000 square foot lots, which are not huge, but, you know, decent sized, large lots, um, that cost doubles to $77. Now, I guess the point here is the way we develop our city has a big impact down the road on cost to us as taxpayers. So if you just imagine, if, if you have a neighborhood of 6,000 square foot lots, you get twice as many lots as if all the lots are 12,000 square foot lots. But the amount of roads and water lines and sewer lines and all of that is roughly double. And uh, I mean, you know, the cost of maintaining those goes up uh, exponentially as you spread out. And that's not to say we're going to tell everybody you have to live in apartments because it's cheaper to serve with water and sewer. But we should be taking those kinds of things into account uh, as we decide how our community develops in the future because different types of development does have different impacts on us as taxpayers. All right, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the improvements. Uh, maybe I'll take a break here and ask if anybody has any questions before I, I talk about the improvements we've made to the process. All right, seeing none, I'll move on. Um, so as I mentioned, we're working on updating handouts, checklists, and our applications. A lot of that has been done. We still have a few to go. Uh, but we found that these have been very helpful. All of this is on our website, uh, and so we have uh, handouts for all kinds of things. I think we have one on fences, which we, sounds like we probably need to update now to say eight feet instead of seven feet. Uh, but if you're building a carport, for example, you can go on our website and, and, and find a handout, print it out, or just look at it online. It says, okay, I'm building a, a carport. Here's what I need to know. Uh, same with all kinds of things that we issue permits for. There are handouts and checklists along with the actual applications all on the website. We've coordinated to a one-stop shop. It used to be you had to go to, you had to take your plans to the fire marshal, you had to take your plans to engineering, you had to take it to permits, you had to take it to planning. Now we have one person, you drop your plans off with that person and they distribute it out to everybody who needs to review it. In fact, I think it's on an upcoming slide, but we've gone to a digital process where those are all done digitally and they're actually, I was going to say emailed out to everybody. They're not even emailed out. A, a link is emailed that they can view it on, on the city's uh, website, but that's helped improve the development review process. Um, online requests for consultations and DRCs, I'll talk a little bit about more of what those are, but you can request meetings with city staff right through the website. You can, of course, call us up as well. Uh, but you can easily, you could 2 a.m. in the morning, you can type up your, hey, I, I need a meeting with folks about a new development I'm doing and, and do it on our website. Another item that, depending on how you look at it, it could be good or bad, but plans aren't reviewed until they're complete. What we found as we reviewed our processes a few years ago is we would get plans in and they wouldn't be complete and we would say, hey, you need to give us this, this, and this before we can review them but we would keep that plan in front of the next guy who came in. The next guy wouldn't get reviewed until we did project number one, but that one we were waiting on stuff for him. So now what we do is project one, you're not complete, we set it aside and we go on and start working on project number two. When you get all your stuff on project one back into us and it's all complete, then we'll send it through the review process. So folks who are getting us all the information we need are getting through the process much faster because we're not holding them up behind people we're still waiting on information from. Good, that's good to hear. Uh, concurrent review, something else we're doing more of is you can apply for two different things at the same time and we don't wait, you know, we don't wait for you to get this approval before we'll even start reviewing these plans. So for example, if, if your property needs rezoning to commercial in order to do the business you want to do, we'll go ahead and take your commercial building plans and start reviewing them even while, while the zoning is going through the process. So it's shortening some of those reviews uh, as well. I'm going to do that firsthand. It, it's great. Good. Again, Thinking good. you're going to have to wait three months before you can even start. Right. Like 
Another thing we've just done recently in the past, you had to submit, I talked about a site plan, you had to submit your site plan and your building plans all at once. And what we found, and this is how most other cities do it, you might have your site laid out. Here's where the building's gonna sit, here's where the parking is, here's the driveway. You may have all that done, but you're still doing some of the internal plans on your building. Um, why not go ahead and get us the site plan and we'll review it ahead of time. But used to, we wouldn't take your site plan until you were done with all your building plans too. Now we'll go ahead and start the process for the site plan. And if there are issues with that, you can go ahead and be working those out while you're still finishing drawing up your building plans. Uh, and so that, that has helped speed up some of our review process as well. And we also started doing three or four years ago satisfaction surveys. Um, how did we do? And we encourage people to respond to those because we re honestly want to know if you had a problem with one of our processes, we want to know what the problem was and how we can fix it. Um, since we started this about, I think, I guess 2014, um, our average commercial plan review went from 25 days down to 12 days. Uh, so we've significantly reduced the amount of time the average project takes to go through the review process. Um, and I, I don't think I included it on this presentation, but I did a presentation recently for City Council and broke that down into uh, what percentage of projects were done within our goal is to have them all done within three weeks. Um, and I think it was a, a, a high percentage. I don't want to be wrong, so I don't want to say, but well over half of the projects were reviewed in the time frame that we set as our goal to review those projects within. Uh, the customer service survey showed from 2014 to 2017, the numbers all went up from something like 70 to 80 percent of people satisfied with the process they went through to now almost all the questions get 90 percent and plus uh, in terms of people saying they were satisfied uh, with the process. Again, that's only as good as the people who answer the questions. So. Uh, not everybody who goes through one of our processes fills out the survey, but we, we, it's out there and we encourage everyone to do that. And then I mentioned electronic plan review began rolling out. We're not using it for all of our processes, but we are using it for some. Uh, and those, you can now submit your plans uh, through the city's online plan review process. And so, again, doesn't apply to all projects, so I don't want to set the expectation too high, but we're going to the point where uh, you're not going to have to bring in a set of, you know, plans that are, you know, big format plans that rolled up and, you know, uh, talked to one developer and he had to bring in a new set of plans and he said, you know, just the printing cost for those plans is going to cost me another $300. Well, we're moving towards you can just submit those as a PDF through this online review software uh, won't even have to bring in a set of paper plans at all. Do you guys have a, a check system within y'all zone departments? Um, because I understand what you're saying. I think it's really great. That, you know, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm just seeing a pretty good sized job here in Angelo. But do you guys have your own check system for you guys? And the reason I'm saying that is because, granted, everybody's busy. And, 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 and man, if it seems like oh, I'm just kicking in the stomach, I don't mean to be kicking sure, in the sure. stomach. This is, this is just real life issues that we're getting, but so, sometimes, John, you guys don't have the people. I mean, this sounds great, and for the most part, it is. But we have an issue right now where, where we had our, our stuff stuck in the fire marshal's office because you guys don't have the adequate people. Is there something in place to help us with that? Because man, a lot of time has been lost because of that. Well, there, there are a couple things I'll mention. One is this electronic plan review allows us to track that. And in fact, once it's all fully operational, you as a client, as a customer, can log into this system and see, yeah, planning's reviewed it and approved it, engineering's reviewed it and approved it, but it's still waiting on the fire marshal and the building inspector. And you'll be able to see, and, and we can see from our end, how long each person took to approve and review things. Well, again, not all of it and not for all processes, but it's, it's being rolled out uh, right now. We can see for the, for the projects that we are doing the electronic plan review, we can see who's holding up a project and we can create reports. So 
in the future, we can look back and say, okay, in 2018, the average review time for commercial projects was you know, five days for the planning, depart planning division, 10 days for engineering, 20 days for fire marshal or whatever the numbers are. And we could see uh, and maybe even show that to city council and say, look, fire marshal needs more people to, if you want to reduce this number. Now, right now, you probably know this, but they had either two or three people leave the fire marshal's office and they've only got five or six total. And so they are a little short staff now. And so until they get those positions filled, it is going to take a little bit longer for them to review it. Because uh, normally we haven't seen them be that much of a delay in the process. So as long as it's, as long as it's in the mix, man, we, you know, we're, we're, we're looking forward to it. Because sure. we, this is a great town to live in, man. It really is. It's a good town to live in. And, uh, man, we, we, like to see, we like to see it grow in a positive fashion. I think you guys are... Good job, and like I said, if it seems like I'm kicking your stomach, I don't need to because sure. I like it. I I let this out. I can't wait to come back. Sure, well, good. Well, and I hope what you hear from this is number one, we've made some improvements, and we're getting pretty good reviews on the improvements we've made. But I also want you to hear, like on this slide, we are we do have some other upcoming improvements. We know there are things we need to to work on as well. Um, but also, if there are things, there are always things. That, what I tell people is we don't know there's a problem unless we know there's a problem. And the, the thing that bugs me more than anything is when a developer comes in to meet with me about a project and they say, you know, a year ago I had this issue. I was like, well, who did you tell? Well, no one. I didn't want to. I'm like, you got to tell somebody. We, we've made so many improvements in the department because somebody picked up the phone and said, hey, John, did you know that this process I had to jump through this hoop? And we said, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Let's change that. And we have. We've taken, I don't know how many ordinance amendments. We've changed our ordinances um, over the past year. We've done six or eight of minor amendments to say, well, we don't really need to be requiring that, so let's make a change. Uh, but we have to know there's a problem before we can fix it. Uh, we're looking at more uh, applications being available online. We're looking at online payments. Some of that, I think, is already in place. Where Some of the permits you can, a water heater permit, I know, for example, you can go online. You don't even have to come to City Hall. You go online, fill it out, pay online, and you're done. You, know, you get the, you know, again, you don't even have to walk into our office. We're working on a development handbook. Uh, that's going to be sort of tying a lot of the checklists and uh, handouts all together. But the thing I like is we're looking at flowcharts because, at least for me, flowcharts help to see, okay, what's step one? What's step two? Is there a decision point? i got to go this way or this way. Uh, and so we're looking at working on some flow charts to help people understand how to navigate through the process. We're kind of early in that, but hopefully that'll be done over the next uh, six months or a year. And again, more updates to the zoning and subdivision ordinances. We have a list based on concerns and comments we've heard from the development community of things we want to change in, uh, in those codes uh, to help fix some of the issues uh, that we've seen. So I've mentioned the city's website does include links to all of our ordinances as well as all the informational handouts and checklists that we have. Like I said, we're working on more of those uh, as we go along, but they are on the website. If you can't find them, that's something else I'd like to know. Periodically, I'll go on there and say, okay, if I want to find a carport handout, how do I find that? And if I have to click around too many times and I can't find it, well, you know, the, the 60 year old lady who wants a carport in her front yard, is going to have the same problem, if not worse, because hopefully I know a little bit more about our website. Um, but yeah, we're, we're trying to make the website more user friendly uh, and any help we can get on that would be helpful. So I mentioned earlier consultations in the DRCs. These are voluntary meetings. You don't have to do them, but we strongly encourage it because what these are, uh, a consultation is very early in the process when you just have a general vague idea of what you want to do, but not the specifics. And then a development review committee is when you actually are almost ready to apply, but you want to sit down with us and ask questions. And it pulls everybody together from planning, engineering, public works, fire marshal, permits. Everybody who will ultimately review those plans is around the table where you as a, a project developer can ask questions. Okay, how many fire hydrants am I going to need? Or am I going to have to sprinkle this building, uh, you know, if it's over a certain size, do I need fire sprinklers? Um, you can get those kinds of questions asked um, 
in one of these meetings. We find that people who go through this process have many fewer issues come up later on because they came in uh, asking the questions at the beginning. I think I may have this on a future slide, but I'll go ahead and say it. Um, one of the, the problems we have as staff is trying to answer the questions that you don't ask. Um, and, you know, our crystal ball sometimes works, and so we sometimes can say, well, did you think about this? But the more information you give us, the better we can help you answer the question. Because, to be honest, some of the times when we tell you, well, here's all the things you have to do, and then you come back and submit, and we say, oh, there's one more thing we didn't see, sometimes that's because you never told us at the beginning. Now, I'm saying that's your, not with your, your situation, um, and other times, it's, we had a recent example where um, a building, the building wasn't in place, they just drew it on a plan, but the building had to be moved over. Well, that resulted in the dumpster having to be moved, but then that blocked a fire lane. So we didn't know that they were going to have to move a fire lane, but because of everything else shifting around, sometimes that raises other issues that really weren't issues to begin with. So. Um, Anyway, going through this early process, uh, we found is very helpful for folks. I don't know if this is the proper place to ask this, but what is the deal on residential sprinklers? Is that a state code now, a national? Is that a, well, adopted by the city? No, it, it won't be. Um, the International Fire Code has included a requirement for fire sprinklers in new residential construction. All. Well, but bear with me. Uh, the state of Texas has adopted a rule saying cities in Texas will not adopt that. And so um, Texas cities cannot require fire sprinklers in single family homes. Um, well, unless they, unless they amend it. Unless they amend it because but the state would have to change it because I know there are some cities that would like to require that. And I may be I may be out of date on my information, but my understanding was the state has said cities can't do that. Now maybe they grandfathered cities who had already adopted sprinkler requirements, but my understanding was the state said that cities can't adopt that. But in any case, the city of San Angelo has not adopted any sprinkler requirements for single-family homes. You can do it, of course. I mean, we've had a few folks do it. Can the fire um, marshal require it? Do no. It? Again, that would be probably a question better answered by the fire marshal, but my understanding is that um, he cannot require that. We, we have had a few cases where they said, well, you've got to do this or this. We had a development that, well, long story short, they could do a, one of like three different options. One of those options was a sprinkler, but they could do other options too. Um, but no, we, we cannot is my understanding we can't require sprinklers in single-family homes now we do obviously in a lot of commercial development right. and apartments and those sorts of things but not in single-family homes so now this is where i get to some of the common issues that we've heard from our staff here are the things that they see people running into roadblocks or problems that they they occur uh, conducting work without a permit you know Hopefully most contractors, most plumbers, electricians know when you need a permit and when you don't, but we still have issues with folks thinking they don't need a permit when in fact they do, and then when they do come in to permit something, we see other stuff that had been done without a permit, and then that creates issues. So it's always better to check, do I need a permit for this um, before you start a project, uh, because even some of our local contractors sometimes get it wrong. and think they didn't need a permit when in fact they did. You can get it wrong. <laughs> uh, lack of familiarity with code requirements. Again, that can apply to the contractors, but that often applies to folks who want to do it themselves. And as we were talking about beforehand, some of these do-it-yourself shows on HGTV, people think they can go out and, and do all their remodeling themselves, and a lot of people can. Uh, but there's still, there's still a way to do it right, and if it's something that needs permits, you gotta get permits, and we see a lot of issues with folks who just don't know what they're doing, trying to do it, uh, and we help them as best we can, um, but, and also using unlicensed contractors. Again, check and make sure they're licensed in the city to work, because if they're not, uh, they're clearly not pulling permits, because we won't give them a permit 
if they're not licensed with the city. Well, we're talking about that, how does that play into uh, the real estate inspectors? Because I'll give you an example. Um, my dad, he, he, he has a plumbing outfit here. And you get these, these home inspectors that come in for a real estate agency. Uh, one, of the, one of the big no-nos in plumbing is you can't use PVC inside a house or going through a return air or anything like that. But you can't use PVC anywhere under a house, inside a house, or the hot water line. Uh, to me, that seems it would fall under an unlicensed contractor because these people are professing to be an inspector and they don't have no background. Well, and don't hold me to this, I thought residential home inspectors that work for realtors or banks or as part of buying a house have to be licensed with the state as a home inspector but I'm not 100% sure about that um, well because but how can you inspect the discipline that you have no well that is a good question my understanding is home inspectors are only looking for a certain set of, of things they may not even be looking at is and I would guess that they're not looking at there's PVC when it shouldn't well, actually, be. When you look at their report that they give you, they, they have it all outlined. On. You can you can call any one of them. So do we call and turn them into the city? You mean if if they're inspecting things and not spotting things that they no, should well, be? I, I'm telling you, call call one in and you'll be surprised what they inspect because that would fall under using unlicensed contract. Well, now again, we, that home inspection side of things is something we don't get involved in at all. We only, our office only deals with new, new stuff. If you're putting in new plumbing, you're rewiring electrical, you're building a new addition, you're building a new house or building, the only time you have to come in for us to get permits is if you're doing something new to it. We don't get involved at all if somebody's just inspecting what's already there. That might be something you want to look into. Well, maybe. I, th I think we, our inspectors have enough to do at this point. Um, uh, and this is something I like to remind people. Our inspectors don't like to issue failed inspections. They don't like to give people red tags. And they'll work with you as much as they can to help you figure out what the right answer is. But the second bullet is important too. We can't, design, we can't tell you exactly what to do. We can tell you it doesn't meet code. Here's what the code says. But we're not going to start laying out a, you know, here, here's how you need to run the plumbing. That's for the plumber to do but we, we do have to inspect it and make sure it does meet all the codes and can tell you how it doesn't meet the code. You really do have a real strong inspection department. I'm, no, I'm telling you that. You have a really strong inspection department. I mean, as a whole. Uh, you know, the, Annette, Rachel, I mean, as a whole, you, you, you guys probably have, and I've worked all over the U.S., you guys have probably got one of the strongest inspection departments I've ever worked with. Good. Well, that's good to hear. Hopefully, Brian got that on tape. We can... Uh, Use that later. Hopefully he got the other stuff on <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll cut that out. No. Um, hand drawn plans, you know, we actually will accept hand drawn things, but uh, we do have to have things to scale and drawn appropriately. We do get people drawing things on graph paper and, and measuring it out, and, and that's okay. But, you know, we prefer professionally done plans, but that's not required. Uh, but on the other hand, you can't take a piece of notebook paper. Uh, tear it out of the spiral and just hand draw something in, in five minutes and put a couple labels on it. You know, you, we have to be able to tell ex you know what you're doing enough to know whether it meets our, our codes and standards or not. Another big problem we see is changing details in the field. Uh, we had a restaurant being built recently and I think they expanded the width just enough. Or, you, know, you know what it was, an uh, internal wall, they moved over a couple of feet. Well, that created an issue that the room on one side of that wall then didn't meet the fire code in terms of the width of that wall. And so didn't tell anybody and nobody noticed it until our inspector was inspecting that wall in the field and said, hey, wait, this is a problem. Um, you know, how do we know that there's a problem on the plans? It shows it correctly. Um, and nobody told us they moved the wall over two feet. The contractor just decided, hey, it'd be better if this room were a little bigger. And so again, that's that's something we see more than we would like to see is changes being made on the ground uh, without coming back in and, and letting us know and, and saying, yeah, that'll work. And patience. Again, we we have a certain number of staff. If it's a busy time of year, 
we get things as fast as we can, but some, some times of year, reviews are gonna take a little bit longer. If you've got two or three plans in front of you for review, um, I will say it's not in my presentation here, but we do have a process back, back when the, the oil boom from, what was it, 2012, uh, around that time, um, we got a pretty big backlog where we were getting so many developments, so many new projects, that the time it took to review these plans was just taking a, a longer than, than we like. And the city council adopted a change to our ordinances that allows folks to go to a third party. So we actually have a process where we can send your plans out to a third party. They can review it quickly, get it back to us. Um, it does, it costs. I mean, there's a fee for that. Um, so if you want to get through our process quicker, you can go to this third party. Now with the time frames we're seeing, it just doesn't make sense because we're as fast as they are. But if it ever gets to a point where we've got so much happening that things are getting delayed, we do have that option for developers that can go to a third party uh, and get those plans reviewed and inspected. Um, well, not inspected, the, the plan review side uh, can be done. Is there a reduction in the permit fee? I actually think there is, but I'd have to check on that because because if we're not doing the review, yeah. and in fact, I think we don't charge you any fee for the plan review, but we just pass on the cost that this third party charges us for the plan review. But again, it's going to be higher than what our fees are. I, I have one more thing on there that you said earlier that plan reviews take 20, been reduced from 25 days to 12 days. That's working days. It is business days, and that I, I can see how that might be a little misleading. It's not. Yeah. It doesn't count days that we're not in the office, so it's review days. Right. Uh, but yeah, that is a good clarification. So fire marshal's office. Here's some things they mentioned. So, uh, f again, floor plans that don't match what's built. Uh, they review the plans and they say everything looks good, but if you build it differently out in the field you know, you're sort of taking a chance that if you might end up doing something that then doesn't meet the fire code. There's also no grandfather, and we talked about non-conforming things earlier. Um, most of our rules, if it's something that's already there, you're kind of, you get a pass because it's already built that way. But there are some things in the fire code that you can't do. If, if you have a building that was built with only one exit and it's big enough that it requires two exits, you're not going to get around that. You're going to have to put in that second exit in most cases uh, for some of those very critical life safety things they're not going to give you a pass and, and grandfather what's already there you're going to have to fix it and again they said be patient sometimes it takes a while uh, and they have to do multiple inspections uh, the fire suppression for example they inspect it before during and after installation um, one of the issues we're, we're working much better at because we've created a new process um, we sometimes had an issue in the past where, you know, a new restaurant has said, we want to open, you know, next Friday. Uh, and they come to us like three days before they want to open and say, hey, we want to open Friday. And then all of a sudden, well, fire marshal hasn't approved your, your sprinkler system and, you know, planning hasn't approved your landscaping or whatever. That's not a good example because we don't hold people up for just landscaping. But um, now we've started a process of checking back with folks um, because part of the problem was, if they started a year and a half ago and now they want to open, if they didn't come to us a couple of weeks in advance and say, hey, we're going to open in two or three weeks, uh, we had no reason to start checking to make sure they had done all the things they had said they were going to do. And so we've started a process where we start looking at those earlier um, so that we're not holding folks up uh, and getting those inspections done because if the fire marshal goes out and there's something wrong with the sprinkler system that they've got to fix, well now that might add an additional day or two um, and that you don't want to get on the bad side of a restaurant that's already announced their grand opening on a certain date and so we're, we're working really hard to help ensure that we're helping folks get open on time. Uh, engineering, incomplete plans is something they see and that's often most of the things they see are you're hiring a professional engineer to do for you. Um, but uh, another thing I would say is, is communication um, because if you, you hire an engineer to get you through this engineering process, whether it's road design or wa extending a water line or, or any of that kind of thing, um, 
we are communicating with that agent. So typically the engineer, we find that sometimes that information is not getting back to the owner. Um, and so it, you as the owner or project uh, manager needs to be in contact with your engineer to make sure you know what's going on. Because if you're the owner, we're not going to call you and say, hey, you know, this is the problem because we're telling the, your engineer that. And so sometimes it's that lack of communication. And I don't mean to pick on engineers because this might apply to plumbers or contractors or other folks. Um, but that communication is important. Yeah. Just back to the different permits real quick. I was yeah. looking back over it and uh, the one on the tent permit, mm -hmm. now out at the lake there's signs saying no overnight, uh, you can't sleep overnight out there in the, in the campground area. How would a tent permit be utilized? Yeah, and that's a good question. A tent permit doesn't apply to tent camping and that sort of thing. That's for these big tents, like uh, somebody has a special event and they have one of these big tents that's maybe you know half the size of this room. Um, that's what we inspect because there are some fire issues with, um, and we don't even require a permit or inspection if if it's going to be up less than you know like four hours. But it's sometimes people will have these outdoor events and they'll have one of those tents up for days, and so we do inspect those because there are some mostly fire uh, issues, especially if they have those walls that roll down. Uh, and people getting in and out kind of thing. Um, we sometimes have engineers say, well, at the bottom of their plan, it just says, we'll be built to city standards. Well, that's not good enough. You have to actually show on the plans how it meets uh, the city standards. And, and sometimes we see folks, if they're on a TxDOT highway, they submit their drainage plans to TxDOT. TxDOT says, oh, that's great. Um, not realizing you also have to submit it to the city because our drainage standards in some cases are higher than theirs and they think because TxDOT signed off on it they're done and, and in fact they're not and sometimes that's created delays in projects because they just you, they didn't know till too late in the process that they had to go through our review as well. And John, who, who is allowed to submit a drainage plan? Does it have there a, a qualification for that? I believe there is. Um, I think I think you have to be a licensed engineer to submit a drainage plan. I'm not 100% sure about that. Our engineering department could answer that, but um, I'm fairly confident that that to do a drainage plan that meets the city's drainage plan requirements does require a licensed engineer. Pretty sure. Um, again, Engineering Services webpage has information uh, applications, common ask questions, those sorts of things. Um, well, and this says complicated projects usually require an engineer. So there may be some minor things that you could do That's on your own, um, oh, but that would, that would be for our engineering department to, yeah. to answer the question. Well, and you only have to do a drainage plan if you exceed a certain threshold. So if it's over a certain square footage or, or you're paving over a certain percent of the lot. 5%. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if it's a vacant lot and you're building a home, or yeah, if it's over five percent, you have to have the drainage plan. In most cases, yes. Yeah. Uh, planning and development services. Uh, be aware of special areas with unique regulations. So we have some what we call overlay areas, where in addition to the normal rules that apply, there are additional sets of rules, like the river corridor. So if you're close to the river or if you're in downtown, we also have some historic zoning areas where you have to go through another process of review. Who that? Well, ultimately they're adopted by city council, so they, they map a boundary. So for example, we have the river corridor, and if you're in that area and there's maps on the city's website that show what's the, what's the river corridor, then you have to go through a special review process um, to ensure that you're compatible with, with that area. Same with historic making sure you're keeping with the historic character. That's something that trips people up in the downtown a lot is um, there's a design review process you have to go through uh, if you're doing certain things in downtown. At airport zoning, we don't get that a lot, but if you're building out near the airport, there's some height limits and things. You know, you don't want planes crashing into buildings because you build a 10-story building near the airport. Um, and uh, plan developments also, you, if you look at our zoning map, in addition to the residential, commercial, industrial, sometimes you'll see one called plan development. And that's basically a, 
unique zoning district created just for one individual property. So we can write a set of rules that are unique. Uh, Shannon, for example, because the hospital complex is so different than basically anything else. Are these, are these people rotated? So the same ideas don't stay stagnant? Which people? Like the, let's say the River Corridor or the historic? Yes, those folks are appointed by City Council on the River Corridor Commission, or it used to be the River Corridor Commission, now it's the Design and Historic Review Commission. Uh, they're appointed by City Council and they have term limits. So every few years they go off and somebody else new comes on. Like how many years? Say two years. Two years. Three terms. Two years, three terms. So six years is the maximum anyone could serve. But sometimes after their first two year term, that City Council person could say, you know, Bob's been on there long enough, let's appoint Sally or, you know, whatever the case may be. Hopefully those aren't real names on her. Um, Last year, only 40% of submitted plans were complete and didn't require additional information. But again, for most of our plan review, we have the checklist right there that you can see, here's all the information you need to submit. So if you're in that 40%, your plans are getting reviewed much quicker than the other 60% because what we do is look at your plans, hey, you're missing something, get it back to us and then we'll start reviewing it again. Uh, but then we're waiting on you. I had a complaint. Um, we get lots of complaints as you can imagine but I had a complaint um, and the complaint was it took seven months from the time I submitted my application till I got my building permit well I'm like well crap that's not good uh, how do we deal with that so I asked our staff to pull together well what's all the information and it turns out of that seven months over four months, almost five months, was spent waiting on them for one thing or another. We, and, and I say that not to say that, you know, it was necessarily their fault, but in, in, in that case, there were some floodplain issues. So they had to go to the, whoever, the Corps of Engineers or somebody to get some floodplain stuff worked out. Well, the two months that they're waiting for that approval in my mind, shouldn't count against us in terms of how long it took us to get them a permit. So when we presented that information to uh, the owner and the, in this case, a city council person, they were like, well, yeah, that makes sense. So um, if you hear some of those complaints out in the community, absolutely some of them are true. Sometimes we screw up, sometimes we take longer than we should, and we're trying to fix those things. But some of the complaints you'll hear out there are, are things that really aren't true. So take it with a grain of salt when you hear those complaints out there because I, I would argue we're doing a lot better than we have in past years and we're continuing to make improvements and some of the complaints I hear are about things that happened three, five, ten years ago. Well, last time I dealt with the city it was this, I had this problem. Well, unless you're having that problem today, you know, it's a lot of those problems we fixed. So, um, I think people tend to lump in planning and permits. As, as they're really two different Thanks. Well, but it's all the city. T to be fair to, to, you know, if somebody complains to me, well, planning did this or permits did this or engineering did this, I can say, well, I can deal with planning and permits. That's in my department. Engineering is not in my department. I can't fix that. But, but to you guys, honestly, it's all the city. And so part of my job is to help ensure that all of these processes are, are workable. And if that means going, me going to engineering and saying, hey, I got this complaint, here's a process that we can fix. Um, we want to try to fix it across the board. In charge of the stormwater issue. Yes, but again, we have a, this one stop where you come into the planning and permits office to submit all your plans and we will get them to everybody who needs it. We'll communicate back to you. You need X, Y, or Z. That doesn't stop you from going directly to engineering, but it, uh, a lot of people like the ability to, they have one person they can call hey, I haven't heard from engineering, what's the status? And that person can then get the answers for you rather than you having to go to a bunch of different places to get those answers. I wish I had a checklist with me because that stormwater one just scares me to death every time because you, you don't know. I mean, I, 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 somebody's going to buy a residential lot and want to build a house on it and you've got to get an engineer's approval for a stormwater review or something. In most cases, you don't have to do that for single-family homes because 
generally when when the developer lays out the whole subdivision they have to do a drainage plan for the whole subdivision so usually there's a drainage pond or retention pond or something that serves the whole neighborhood so in most cases if you're building a home on an already platted residential lot you don't have to do any of that it's it's already been done usually yeah as far as with the banner permits as far as that goes I don't have a 40-foot ladder at my disposal. What is the process normally for people to get their banners up? I understand that a bucket truck isn't available for every banner that goes up. What Can you just help me out? You're talking about the ones like across the Beauregard in downtown? Uh, yeah, you know, that's... Um, that's been talked about. I'll start off by saying that's not handled by my department, so I, I don't have 100% knowledge about it, so I don't want to give you wrong information, but uh, basically the way that process is set up, it's a permit process to, to allow those and to coordinate who gets to put them up. So we basically only do the scheduling for that. Yeah, this, this is open that week, so you can have it for a, a banner, but we leave it up to you to figure out you know, a lot of people use a sign company to print the banner and the sign company hangs it for them too. Um, but basically the city's answer is we've gotten out of the business of hanging those up. We say you can do it, but then you're on your own is, is basically the answer. John, so like infrastructure, like new subdivisions and cutting in streets, that's your, that's it, falls under your realm? It does, the overall review of it. Now the engineering department deals with a lot of the technical review. I mean, they make sure that the pavement's the right thickness and, you know, the, the curbs are built right and all that. Uh, but we do oversee the, that review process. Yeah. Uh, I, I've, I've probably hit on this too many times, but handouts and checklists are available on the website. Um, checklists, uh, hire a professional if, if you think you need to. That's always helpful. Uh, we don't, you know, obviously we don't tell people they have to, but uh, you're going to make your process probably take longer and have more issues come up if you try to do it yourself. And we're happy to work with folks doing it themselves, but um, sometimes it's better just to, to hire a professional. And uh, staff is available anytime. Uh, you can walk in and ask questions. You can set an appointment. You can ask for one of these consultations where we bring everybody around a table to answer questions from, you know, like I said, engineering, planning, permits, all the different groups. But like I said earlier, we can't anticipate everything you should have asked but didn't. We try our best, uh, but oftentimes we answer the question you ask. And if that wasn't the right question, we maybe gave you the right answer, but then when you come back with a different question in two weeks, the answer might be different, but only because, well, you're asking a different question now. So, summary, come in early. Problems are often the result of not coming in early enough and asking the right questions. We're happy to help. We, we do this every week, almost every Friday. We have anywhere from one to three consultations or development review committees meeting with people who are, I, I want to open a restaurant or I want to do a subdivision or I want to do whatever. We can sit down and answer a lot of your questions while you're just at the early planning stages uh, of your project. That's my contact information. I, I gave most of you who are here early a, a card, but if you didn't get one, I, I have a card up here. Um, if you have questions and want to contact me, um, that may be it. I, if there are questions you have or uh, issues you want to talk about, uh, now's your opportunity. I know we ask a lot of questions in, in the middle throughout, so, uh, but if there's something you haven't asked. Uh, one thing I'd like to ask, I I think you mentioned a while ago about PVC inside of a residential unit. If I'm working on residential units downtown and I take an office building and convert it over to residential, am I allowed to run PVC pipe inside that unit? You're getting out of my area of expertise. Uh, I would defer that to either your plumber or one of our plumbing inspectors uh, because even though I, I like to think I know a lot about our development processes, I, you know, the plumbing code is about that thick and I, I don't know all those details. Any other questions? 
Yeah. This is a very general question. So does the planning committee, do they dictate like what kind of businesses are open or built in San Angelo? Um, mostly no. That, and that's a good question because we often get asked, well, why don't you guys bring in a Cracker Barrel? Or, uh, you know, our job is, is really not, you know, picking and choosing what comes in. Our job is letting the market decide that. And when they do want to come in, we help them through our processes, help review them to make sure they meet all of our rules and regulations. But we're not out looking to say, well, we, we, we want a Cracker Barrel, but not a Red Robin. We, we, what, I, what I've been told is, you know, the city won't allow that kind of business. You yeah. know, and I'm like, how, I mean, I didn't know. And for the most part, we don't, we can't restrict any kind of business, really. Uh, one question we sometimes get is uh, what we call the sort of ordinance term is sexually oriented business, but like strip clubs and those sorts of things, we can say they can only be in certain areas, but we can't prohibit them altogether. That's, you know, well, I won't go into all the legal things behind that, but by the same token, we can't say these kinds of restaurants we want and these we don't. Whoever wants to come develop uh, in the city, we'll work with them. And it's really the, the property owners, business owners, and the market that really decides what comes in. I mean, the liability falls on the business owner anyway. Right. I mean, not the city. Well, and just because it's commercial doesn't mean that every commercial business would fall within a commercial zoning district. Right. There, like I mentioned earlier, there are different types of commercial districts, heavy commercial where you could do like an auto repair shop, but then there's a neighborhood commercial where you couldn't. Right. Only some zones would allow restaurants. So yeah, we might say, this area can't have a restaurant. It has to be for homes or apartments or something else. Uh, but we're not going to say, yeah, it needs to be a Cracker Barrel and not a right. Red Robin. Or, yeah. Does the city have any type of restrictions on a restaurant with a, with a liquor license within a certain uh, area of a church? Yes, and I might defer to Hillary on the specifics, but yes, we have an ordinance that says you can't operate with a liquor license within a certain distance of a church or school or um, and every city's rules are a little bit different there are some state rules that apply but the city in some cases can be more or less restrictive you know some cities just say only a certain distance from schools but they don't care about churches and others say well yeah you have to separate from churches too um, and and so that but we do have rules in place that say that and even the measurements can be different some cities measure door to door from the church to the liquor store, some just property line to property line. And so. So, is that come, let's, for example, the old Logan's building, mm -hmm. Roadhouse? It, is that a chance where that new restaurant owner can't get a liquor license because of his or her? proximity to that church behind it? I, I mean, I assume that Logan's had one before. We have to look yeah, at the specifics of each one. But. There are different types of permits, too. So there's like a hard liquor uh, permit. So uh, it might be the case that a liquor store couldn't operate there, but a restaurant that happens to serve alcohol could re could locate there because those are two different types of alcohol permits. As well, beer and wine and liquor could be different. So, right. So there's different types of TABC permitting. Right. So in some places, there's liquor store, there's convenience stores that sell alcohol, there's restaurants that serve alcohol, and the rules for each of those are slightly different. Any other questions? Yeah. So we want to build a fence around a commercial building, but it's, there's houses, a neighborhood behind it, around it. What are the rules for that? Well, in part, it depends on where you are. And I want to go back to this issue of, of a fence. And I want to be clear, you only have to get a permit if it's eight foot or taller, but that doesn't mean that there aren't rules. All fences have rules. So just because you don't have to come in and get a permit, for example, at a, at a home, in your front yard, a fence can only be four feet high. You can't have a six foot fence in your front yard, but you can in your backyard. Uh, around a commercial business, in part, it depends on the zoning and what's around you. So if, if there's homes behind you, the answer is different than if there's other commercial behind you. Um, and if there's a road beside you or not, and if it's the front yard of the business or not. So it really depends on a, it, we would really just have to look at your particular site and say, well, okay, in that case, 
given that zoning and what's around it, here's what you could do for fences. And that's where coming in and just talking to our staff, they could answer those questions pretty easily for you. This is chain link right now, but we want to put metal fences. Right, and there are differences if it's opaque or non-opaque. So if, it's, if you can see through it, the rules are sometimes different than if you can't see through it. And sometimes we require, if you have certain areas that are heavy industrial that have outdoor junk, sometimes they have to be screened. They can't do a chain link fence. They have to do a solid fence. In other areas, you can't do a solid fence. It just depends. Any other questions? All right, well, I appreciate you guys coming. And again, if you have questions later, uh, contact our department. We're happy to help.